Welcome to the Versus History Podcast with your hosts, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Connell Smith, and Elliot Watson. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Versus History Podcast. It's me, your host, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, at History Chappy on social media. Today, we are joined by none other than Martin Routledge, who is the editor, compiler, author of a brand new book. Martin, tell us, please, all about you and your new book, The Beautiful History. Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, well, um. I'm a, a graphic designer and have a design business. So, so a lot of my uh, thinking comes from a design point of view, but I'm also um, a real lover of football and also like history and, and uh, deal a lot with um, museums uh, in the UK, designing uh, exhibitions for them and designing, um, yeah, things around the history of brands as well. So, this all started about um, three or four years ago. We had a book called The, the Beautiful Badge, which we used. Um, we delved into the world of football club badges, uh, uh, the origins of them, what they mean and why they change and who, who creates them. So that was something that we did a few years ago. Now, the new book is called uh, The Beautiful History. And really, it just came to me looking at the what the what each football club badge means um quite often it's a particular event in in uh the a region or a town or within the history of britain or it features a certain character such as uh, henry the eighth for example and if you take a lot of these badges it just seemed to me that you can actually plot out a certain amount of history of 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 britain and so we spent a good few months looking at, well, just seeing if this was possible or if it was just a, a really mad idea that was just going to go nowhere. So, but yeah, we looked at two, three hundred football club badges, looked at what they symbolised. And then you've got kind of obvious ones like um, clubs within uh Lancashire or in Yorkshire that might feature either the red rose or the white rose of their particular particular counties so that's quite a common thing so you straight away you've got how you know the wars of the roses and and um how that's still um symbolized today but then one of the obvious ones that we looked at straight away was was not far from me is Colchester and Colchester has um an eagle on its football club badge and that relates back to Roman times so it's a, it's a Roman eagle that um the legions would carry as they're marching and um, Colchester at the time was the capital of Roman Britain. So it's just amazing that 2000 years later, this symbol is still used on the football club badge. So you've got, you've got the wars of the roses, you've got the Romans, you've got um, clubs such as Plymouth with the Mayflower on its badge. So 1620 taking those pilgrims, um, to America, to the new world. And then you kind of just build it from there. So you've got the kind of the big obvious ones, but looking around, seeing what else helps to tell that story. And over, over a time, we kind of, yeah, had enough to, to fill a quite a substantial book. Um, and, and some are quite obvious, some are, some are kind of unexpected, really. But what it does, it helps tell you the story of why the badge looks like it does, and then where it sits within the history of Britain and what it actually means. So we we wanted it to be very visual, um, very visual. So we found an illustrator who I'd seen his work before, um, Adam Forster, and um, we did some kind of dummy spreads, see how it could work. And we thought, yeah, it could be a goer. And the, the, the publishers were very supportive of us. Uh, it's the same publishers that we um, worked with on the previous book, Pitch Publishing, and and, and took it from there, really. So I spent um, kind of six months researching and looking at which badges to use, and then another 12 months or 18 months actually pl- coming up with the ideas of how to bring these uh, spreads alive, always thinking that the football club badge is the spark on this page. It's the heart of it that then triggers 
the rest of the story into life. And that's what we wanted to do. The whole idea was about using football club badges as the starting point, because, you know, some of it really relates back to uh, my childhood. And, and as a youngster, I wasn't a big reader. I just wasn't particularly academic. I just loved football. So if a book was about football, I'd read it. If it was about something else, I probably wouldn't even look at it. And so to me, using football as the hook and just to get 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 that identification, get that kind of recognition that young people of well, people of any age you see something, they recognize it. It's either their club badge or one that they know. And then you draw them in and then you broaden it out and show the wider the wider historical context. And um, even throughout that, when we've got uh, Colchester that, that I just mentioned and we talk about uh, the Roman eagle, well, in Roman times in Colchester, there was the, uh, the Roman circus, which was the, the chariot race track. Now, back in the day, that held 8,000 people. And the football stadium of today in Colchester can hold about 10,000 people. So you've got these kind of parallels that sometimes, yeah, just kind of seem to link together nicely just to strengthen that the sport, the football aspect and the history aspect and the then and the now and how those things kind of connect. So anywhere that's um, an opportunity to give, you know, to, to pull the things together and to use football then kind of um, we looked at, at doing that. Okay, then I've seen a copy of the book and I, it is visually, it is second to none. It is superstar stunning. But I'm just aware there will probably be people listening to this podcast, Martin, because the same was true about our cricketing history podcast that have perhaps never seen a game of football or as it's known in some part of the world, soccer. Obviously, your book is predicated intrinsically on how football club badges tell the story of British history. But let's unpick it a little bit. Football itself, where does it come from, Martin? Or some people know it's soccer. So where, where, what's its origin? How does it grow in its early days in England? And how are the early football clubs sort of set up? Because we know them as being based in local geographic areas, but that's not the case for every sport. Some in some sports, then in some places like America, it's, it's the college system that sort of dictates and rides high. And it was really, really important in the early days of a number of different sports. So how does football sort of take over in England in its very early days and become the, the huge juggernaut that it is now? Yeah, well, really, it was the, the, the law. It had been in and around for hundreds of years, very informal in what in a village you'd have uh, people from one side of the village and people to the from the other side of the village and you just have a round object or a ball trying to get it from one part of the village to another going back you know many many centuries and they kind of in various forms it existed for hundreds of years until until Victorian times when you know the national the national sport in in the 19 early 19th century was was cricket absolutely and football was was uh, you was was there was no differentiation between football um, or rugby. There was no rules. Everybody had every different region had different rules, and it wasn't until kind of the eighteen fifties, eighteen sixties, where clubs started to um, share ideas and share rules and and kind of come together and think. Well, let's if we're playing a game, let's know that we're all playing to the same to the same rules and know what's going on so a lot of a lot of universities a lot of public schools were the place where uh, teams began uh, to be formed and to be rules written and then often uh, some of these um, ex-school children ex-pupils would go back home and certainly the the founding members of Blackburn Rovers, for example, a couple of them had been to a university where there were rules being put in place. Um, and so the, you know, the 1870s, 1860s, 1870s, these clubs started to be to be formed. Um, and as it became an organised thing, a lot of the, it came from 
a lot of from public school, but to the kind of the industrial north. Um, actually, a lot of football clubs were started by by churches because they saw it as a, an organised um, form of entertainment where it would get the kids off the street. Um, and you know, teams like Celtic, for example, but but there's there's a dozen or fifteen football clubs such as Southampton as well. And Everton all began life as as kind of uh, a football teams linked to church because it was seen as a kind of a good Victorian Christian activity um, that then that then kind of developed from there and around the same time teams um, large large um, organisations and large um, workplaces had organised um, t- uh, games for their for their employees and organised the football teams. So, Arsenal, for example, West Ham United were basically works teams. It was like giving their employees something to do. Um, again, late nineteenth century, and they became, you know, clubs within their own right. So, um, West Ham United, we feature in the book. You know, they were they were the works team of a, a large company called Thames Iron Works right on the side of the River Thames in London. And they were, um, yeah, just set up as another bit of activity. They already had a cricket team. They already had bowling and various things going on. And football was just another thing. Well, it's this kind of newish thing. Um, let's, let's get another, t- let's get a team together, form them and, then it kind of took on its own life, really. Um, so, yes, yeah, slowly became um, from quite kind of wild origins, unruly to be kind of codified and into the to the kind of system of, uh, you know, the Victorian 1888 when the Football League was launched, um, mainly in the Midlands and the North of 12 founding founding clubs. Um and it obviously developed from there. A fascinating story about the genesis of uh, one of my favourite sports and the favourite sport of many people in the United Kingdom and the world over. Thank you very much indeed for that, Martin. OK, we'll segue to um, a very, very um, off piece question, but one that we put to all of our guests. Apologies if this catches you out, but here it is. Uh, if you were sent away to a remote desert island of your choice for five years and you can take with you the following and only the following, one musical album, one drink in addition to water and one book with you for company, apart from the one you've just written, what would they be and why? So we're looking for one album, one drink apart from water, and one book apart from your own. Over to you, Martin. Oh my word. That's a bit of a... <laughs> That's come from nowhere. It That's certainly a... has. <laughs> Um, oh gosh, album! I I'm going to give you a clue, listeners. Top of my head, I'll go list just for the listeners' benefit. If you listen to the very end of the podcast, there might be a question where one of these answers is essential to you winning something. So uh, there is a point to uh, it. Yeah. Okay. A book. Gosh. Right. Album. I would say. I would say the Stone Roses' first album. Great choice. Okay. And uh, thank you. <laughs> Uh, and book, okay, I would go for, I would go for The Secret Diary of Adrian Mole. Written just, by Leicester's very own Sue Townsend. Yeah, fantastic choice. Absolutely, yeah. As a, as a teenager, that absolutely hit home. And I think even now, I read it with my daughter just a few years ago, and it's just as funny now as it was then. Drink, it would have to be, um, it would have to be coffee. I'm afraid a real nice, um, a nice America's favourite. America's favourite after the revolution. Thank you very, very much indeed, Martin. Okay, listeners, you've been primed and warned. When you get to the end of the podcast, there might be a chance to win something where the answer you need to unlock your entry is one of those things. So thanks for that, Martin. Okay, the next question then. Of all the badges that you've written about, could you perhaps pick out one or even two to share the history behind it, to give us a flavour and hors d'oeuvre of what comes in the book obviously i've read it and i think it's absolutely fascinating i think even if you don't like football you're going to find it visually so appealing but if you do like football it's going to unlock a hidden world of history perhaps behind 
some of the iconography and the symbolism on those badges that you've never been exposed to. So over to you, Martin. Could you share one or two of the histories behind a feature in your book, just to whet the appetite, so to speak? I think the first one I would go for is um, Norwich City. Okay, for those that don't know then, where would we find Norwich on the big, well, not too big map of England, considering it can fit into California? Uh, where, whereabouts is it geographically? Well, Norwich is about two hours east of London, I guess. Yeah, it is. It's on the bit on the yeah, east that right. sticks out. That's right. Yeah, historically, very flat folks. There's lots of fens. Um, some of history's most infamous folks have come from that area, such as Oliver Cromwell. And I think there's a Norfolk in Virginia named after some of the pilgrims that left that area in the 1600s uh, to migrate to America. So there you have it on a map. Now tell us about that history. Over to you again. Well, yeah, actually, with the time that um, I'm going to talk about the the important event really in, in Norwich's history in the 16th century, the, the, ta- the city was second in size only to London in, in England. So, it, you know, in, in relative terms, it was a big place. Now, um, the Norwich City badge has a canary on it famously um, and, a, and a castle, but the, the, it's very much the canary, which is the prime element of the design. And that was, the story goes, was that um, there was uh, refugees, there was Protestants that lived in the Netherlands. And as Spain, as Catholic Spain grew and kind of edged their way into the Netherlands, the Protestants basically had to flee and became refugees. And they came over to England and many came to London, but also many came to Norwich Um, and after a, a decade or two, I think there was over a thousand that had actually made their home in Norwich. And a lot of these, um, a lot of these uh, people that came over were um, were weavers. So they kind of the whole community they brought their skills with them, and it was actually a very valuable skill to have in a booming booming city like like Norwich. And actually, they brought their canaries with them because as they were weaving, they liked to have canary their canary in a cage alongside them just to keep wow. them company. And and these these uh, immigrants, you might call them, or refugees, were known as the strangers. And um, but they became, you know, they were they became a real part, a really important part of that community. Um, and you know it shows actually that shows that in this country we take uh, people who in need and i think that that's that was true then and i think hopefully it's true now that we're kind of broad minded and we we're open to to people that that um bring that are in need and they bring uh, their skills with them and so that that norwich wow. canary kind of grew in importance and you know the yellow and the green of the of the the, the football team and the kit and everything revolves around that really. So, um, but yeah, all these canaries that they brought and then actually apparently a lot of these, it became such a popular breed that um, they were exported to America in the 19th century. So these um, Norwich, these yellow Norwich canaries kind of came to the UK and then went off elsewhere. Um, and, I, I had no idea that, that was the case. Uh, Norwich were, uh, I mean, I remember them back in the early 90s. They were really achieving quite a bit. They were in Europe. I think they hosted into Milan or was it AC Milan at one point? They were riding high, but yeah, I yeah. had no idea yeah. at all about the connection. I'd never thought about it, to be fair, but it makes perfect sense. And uh, that is absolutely fascinating. The, the detail that and, can be in a badge. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, sharing. and... and- and also just the fact that even today in Norwich, there is the Strangers Hall, because as I said, they were called the Strangers. So, you know, 400 years later, what we do in the book is talk about the badge and the history, but then also show you that there are places now that you can go and visit. And also on the badge is a is a castle, and that was ordered to be built by William the Conqueror. So you have this Norman castle, you know, from the uh yeah 11th century and you've got the the canary from um the strangers in the 16th century these two key parts of history of the of the city brought together 
you know, that uh, that um, just shows such a kind of, yeah, have a, all, both have very different story, but also what I actually love about the badge is the fact that it was designed in the early 1970s. Um, at the time, a lot of football clubs up until then had used their own town coat of arms on their as their club badge. And clubs were told around about that time that they, they didn't own the badge. They didn't own their town coat of arms, so they couldn't produce things with it on it. They couldn't, it wasn't theirs to then sell on. So to get around this, a lot of clubs decided to have a new badge created. And uh, often it was um, taken the coat of arms and tweaked or changed in some way. But often it was a total start from scratch. And Norwich, actually, like many football clubs, organised a um, a competition open to their supporters and others whoever designed the best badge that would become the the badge of the of the of the club and um it was a guy called um Andrew Anderson it was that's it who who designed it who won the competition and he got paid 10 pound for that badge and two tickets to a match and that's that badge is exactly as it was 50 years ago so the value of that competition to a club, you know, and I, like I said, I, I'm a graphic designer and we deal with brands all the time and we, you know, look at long-term strategies of how a brand evolves. So to create this one badge that hasn't changed for 50 years is quite an incredible thing. Um, and just the value of that, yeah, £10 investment by the club. And that's true as well of uh, Nottingham Forest, was done at the similar time because of the because of the same um, copyright uh, kind of decisions that came in, and Nottingham Forest badge was a the prize for that was twenty five pounds, and that's seen actually as in many people's eyes as the greatest football badge it really is. So, um, and it's the kind of thing that you look at and you think, why would you ever change that? It's absolutely so simple. For a modern digital age, it's it's like it was created for now and you'd never change it. And that was £25 invested by the club back then. So, um, yeah, Norwich and, and Nottingham Forest, like I say, both kind of came about because of those competitions. So, But another, if I've got time, I'll drop in another badge as well. And the badge, the badge itself isn't, it doesn't look particularly special, but that's Plymouth Argyle, and that's got the the Mayflower on it that went to America in in sixteen twenty. But what is really interesting, obviously, Plymouth used it because that's where the Mayflower set off from. But then also in in England, Billericay Town, and also Boston United both use the Mayflower on their badge. It so it shows that how different towns and different clubs have got a claim to uh, an event or to something historic and if that's the most important thing in their town they embrace it and make it kind of make it their own but they also have to share it with other towns that have got a, a you know a similar um you know similar um strong connection with it so um yeah just and just the fact that obviously when we that was one of the first ones that we had in the book it was the first dummy spread that we did. We had uh, we had Colchester and the Romans, and we had Plymouth Argyle and uh, uh, the Mayflower and the sixteen twenty heading off to the New World. And in the book, you have a map of, of 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 Britain and the Atlantic and America, and we plot these badges as they're moving, going across the Atlantic. And it's just just nice to see the three badges together. And like I say, the you know the importance to each town and Billericay. There was there was six or seven people from Billericay that went on to the on to the uh, the Mayflower, and the same from from Boston in Lincolnshire. There was there was several people that that um, were on the ship. So you know they've got everybody. They both got a, you know logical reasoning for for featuring it. So um, on their badge. So that's kind of the the interesting snippet of that so that that's unusual in the book because you've got the three three badges all with the same the same ship on the same mayflower all for different reasons i suppose some of the the names there have carried over into the new world so plymouth the place that the mayflower left from that became plymouth rock or the early plymouth colony 
in the northeast of the modern United States and Boston, Lincolnshire. That's going to become Boston, Massachusetts yeah. <laughs> in 1630, I guess. So some of the the names, I mean, it's pretty common on the east coast of the United States of America. There's lots mm. of English names, either named after English places or English people or English kings or English queens. But I didn't know it spilled over so readily into football. I was aware of Boston United, but I hadn't paid too much attention to their badge or Plymouth Argyle for that matter. I think probably because they're not in the Premier League, but um, yeah, the fact yeah. that it, it pays tribute to or gives a nod to at the very least. Those historical origins is pretty fascinating. Have you got time for one more quickly, just to, just to buy them in? Sure, yeah. What, another badge? Yeah, let's go for it. Oh, gosh, right, okay. Um, is there anything a little, yeah, a little like, bit more recent, just to bring it right up to yeah, date? Yeah, you know what, to bring it right up to date, the book ends with a, a badge which most people, I don't think, would have realised exists, but there is a team in Essex called Hashtag United FC. And their badge is an enormous hashtag. Um, and that, you know, that, that says a lot because that was started up by basically a YouTube celebrity about five or six years ago. Wow. It was all, it was, all, it was basically an online team. Every, everything was done online, but then it became a real team and they now compete at a good level and they've competed in the FA Cup. Um, and they have an enormous following on social media, funnily enough. So, You've got something started up by YouTube celebs. You've got a name called Hashtag United. You've got a big following on social media. And that brings it, that is the last spread of the book of that particular section because it, that introduces, you know, the World Wide Web. That introduces the 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 um, invention of, of the World Wide Web and the internet by Tim Berners-Lee. So it's... Um, yeah, like I say, it's just a nice ending because these badges do plot real events, real key moments in time. And obviously, 1989 was the creation of, of the internet. Um, and so it's just a nice thing to kind of end on that. And, and it's nice, you know, the, the clubs that we feature are massively diverse. We have the big, big Premier League teams. We have lots of um, non-league teams um, so a real, real nice mixture. And if the story was interestingly enough, interesting enough, if it was something that was really engaging, we wanted to feature it on the broader, the broader spectrum of clubs, the better. So they all, and they're all equal. You know what I mean? They're all there, one spread after another. Um, it's not like we give the Premier League much, much more air time. If the story's interesting, then it gets, it, it, it's featured and it's, um, they're all there for, for um for a purpose absolutely fascinating martin thank you very much indeed for sharing that with us well football really does run deep and chronologically it goes back to the distant past but also right up to the not too distant past as well thank you very much indeed for sharing some of those stories with us martin before we get to the competition, just remind us, what's the book called? Who's it published by? And how can we buy it? And is there any social media platforms that uh, we yeah. can connect with you on, just so we can ask any questions or follow the great progress of, the, of this fantastic book? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah, The book is called The Beautiful History. Football club badges tell the story of Britain, because they do. Um, and it's myself, Martin Routledge and Elspeth Wills are the authors and the illustrations are by a fantastic um, artist called Adam Forster. It's published called, it's published, sorry, by Pitch Publishing, who um, published our previous book. And yet we're on Twitter and on Twitter we are at Beautiful Badge, just to confuse you, because that's, the, that's <laughs> the name of our first book, is Beautiful Badge. So if you look at at Beautiful Badge or go to the website, um, which is thebeautifulhistory.com and there's imagery there and, and a bit more detail about the book. But yeah, on Twitter, we, we, we um, share snippets of the book and, and images and little insights and stories. But then also um, we were last week, we were visiting schools and talking about the book and um, and actually we had a competition for when we were designing the book, a competition with various schools asking school kids to design 
their football club badge and the best ones um, we featured in the book. So we had 40 entries that actually feature in the, in the, the back section of the book and each, uh, each youngster that had their work published, we have visited and given them a book. So they've seen their book, seen their work in print and uh, yeah, last week we were visiting schools in uh, in Leicester actually last Friday, and handing out the books to the to the kids whose uh, designs had been selected, and it was just amazing. You know, you got from five years old right up until uh, teenagers, and just for them to have their work featured and to be be a published artist, I think is a bit of a nice feel good factor. Um, so yeah, there was lots of nice pictures of us handing out the books on on Twitter as well. So it's good fun. It's all good fun. Well, where does the good stuff end? Because it's a community history about football club badges uh, involving the community as well. It doesn't. The great stuff just doesn't stop. Thank you for sharing that with us, Martin. Much appreciated. Now, listeners, you will remember perhaps that I asked Martin Routledge a bit of an off-piste curveball uh, question earlier on. I asked Martin if he were to be sent to a desert island for five years and and he could take one album, one drink and one book with him for company. What would they be and why? And a rather perplexed Martin, uh, who gave gave us some answers, he gave us the name of one album. Now, listeners, if you can recall the name of the album to celebrate the launch of this fantastic new book, The Beautiful History, Football Club Badges Tell the Story of Britain, we're going to give away at our own expense a couple of copies of this book. So if you go over to versushistory.com or the Versus History Twitter feed, you'll be able to link to an entry pro forma. It will ask for your name and just some key details and that answer. If you submit that, we'll pull out two lucky winners from the hat. And then those two lucky winners will receive a copy of the beautiful history, Football Club Badges Tell the Story of Britain, on us just in time for the festive holiday. And it's open to anyone in the world, wherever you live, we'll get a copy to you on Versus History. So, listeners, thank you for listening. And Martin, thank you for coming on to Versus History to talk about that amazingly rich and diverse and inclusive history of football club badges. I mean, I'm absolutely blown, blown away, not just... Uh, by the interview but the product as well it is visually stunning and it's always so interesting when you think you know about something which I do with football but then you realize when you start to read you really don't know the backstory and, and what has gone into making the history as it is so thank you for bringing that into the public domain and making it part of our sort of conscious ether thank you very much indeed for bringing it to the table it's a fantastic piece of history that should be celebrated Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for uh, inviting me along. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's a pleasure on behalf of myself, the listeners and the co-editors of Versus History. All the best of success with the book. And thank you very much indeed. Have a great day. We hope to hear from you again soon. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you now. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to this edition of the Versus History podcast. Visit us at www.versushistory.com and follow us at Versus History on Twitter and Instagram. You can download all episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify or from wherever you get your podcasts.